Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged and uh, very pleased to have today our speaker, ANU Distinguished Professor Ross Garno, uh, representing or presenting the Garno Climate Change Review, which was commissioned by Australia's Commonwealth, State and Territory Governments to examine the impacts, the challenges and the opportunities of climate change for Australia. It is my great pleasure to invite Ross Garno to address us this afternoon on the costs and benefits of climate change mitigation. Thank you. Uh, Heinz Arndt's intellectual interests were eclectic and passionate. He grounded his academic life in economics because that was where the solutions to problems of po poverty were likely to be found. But he remained interested in the scientific, political and philosophical context. By mid-career, he was forming the view that to work on the economic problems of rich countries was akin to membership of the groups that sprang up in industrialising Britain in the 19th century to assist genteel ladies in distress. That was when he moved to the Coombs Building, here, to specialise in development, and began the work that leaves this place today the main world centre outside Indonesia for the study of the Indonesian economy. Hunter's eclectic and wide interests and his early concentration on development made him unfashionable in the economics profession as it narrowed its focus to increasingly technical issues and to the reliable data series that could only be found then in advanced countries. Climate change was a Heinz Arndt sort of issue. It draws to itself all of the threads of human intellectual endeavour and it arouses political passion. Heinz would have become deeply interested and argumentative about the science, the international relations and the philosophy. His passion would have been the father to his intellectual positions, rather differently as he moved famously across the Australian political spectrum over time. Over nearly 40 years, I managed to discuss issues from widely different perspectives with Heinz without ever having had anything like an argument. On central issues in economic policy, I suppose our views did not differ much. After he followed my generation of ANU economists away from the old Australian view in sympathy with protection to unequivocal commitment to free trade. We managed never to descend to what could be described as argument through many discussions from widely different positions on the big international political issues of our times in our region, the Vietnam War, the recognition of China and East Timor. It would have been like that with climate change as it came to occupy more of my mind last year and this. But Heinz would have been having arguments with lots of others and sending letters off to the Canberra Times and articles to Quadrant, never as a sceptic, always as a believer or an atheist. I thought that I would use this occasion to talk about the conceptual framework of my climate change review for the federal, state and territory governments. How do we assess whether Australian mitigation action is justified? Would the substantial costs of mitigation be exceeded by the avoided costs of climate change? What degree of mitigation would lead to the largest net benefits? These turn out to be immensely complex questions. The Garneau Climate Change Review seeks to form and to present judgments relating to the key mitigation choices for Australia in a transparent way. In the draft report that will be released to the Australian public on July the 4th, uh, we will provide a sense of the early tendencies of analysis. The supplementary draft report at the end of August will present a comprehensive set of results from the quantitative analysis completed for the review, the work on the costs of mitigation jointly with the Australian Treasury, and separate analysis of the benefits of mitigation through diminished climate change. The review's conclusions will be drawn together in the final report to be presented to governments at the end of September and released soon after. Climate change mitigation decisions in 2008 and for the foreseeable future are made under conditions of great uncertainty. There is large uncertainty about the climatic outcomes of varying concentrations of greenhouse gases, about the impact of various climate outcomes, and about the costs and effectiveness of adapting to climate change. There is uncertainty about the costs of various degrees of mitigation in Australia. There is large uncertainty about the extent to which the international community will make effective commitment to mitigation and about the relationship of global to Australian mitigation efforts. Under such uncertainty, it is always sensible to ask whether it would be better to delay decisions while information relevant to the decision is gathered and analysed. 
However, it is, it is as much a decision to delay action as it is to decide to take early action. The issue, of course, is whether delay would be a good decision. In 2008, the costs of delay on a balance of probabilities are high. The mainstream science, the tendencies in global economic development and the state of the international decision-making process suggest that business as usual in a, is running Australia and the world towards high risk of dangerous climate change at a rapid rate. The opportunity costs of delaying decisions are high. Australia and its partners in the international community will, for good reasons, make historic and fateful decisions about their approaches to climate change mitigation in the three years ahead. The review's approach to the important questions about mitigation policy starts with scientific assessment of the costs of climate change to Australia and Australians. We have to be able to compare the costs of climate change without and with varying degrees of effective mitigation and adaptation effort. These costs include indirect costs through effects on other countries uh, to the extent that these feed back into Australia uh, or are valued by Australians in themselves. The scientific assessments are highly uncertain and their impacts on human activity and welfare even more so. We have no alternative to making decisions on complex issues of valuation under great uncertainty. Risk relates to an event that can be placed on a known probability distribution. When we cost, toss a coin twice, we do not know whether or not we will see two heads. If we double toss the two coins enough times, they will both fall as heads around a quarter of the time. In many spheres of human life, an activity has many similarities with others that have been repeated many times, so that participants have a reasonable idea of the odds. That's risk. There is uncertainty when an event is of a kind that has no close precedence, or too few for a probability distribution of outcomes to be defined, or where an event is too far from understood events for related experience to be helpful in foreseeing possible outcomes. Humans are often required to form judgments about events that are unique or so unusual that analysis based on secure knowledge and experience is an absent or weak guide. Columbus sailing west in search of China is an historically important example. Bayesian decision theory advises us that we will make the best possible decisions under uncertainty if we force those who are best placed to know to define subjective probabilities that they would place on various outcomes and work through the implications of those assessments as if they were prob probability distributions based on experience. In truth, while the distinction between risk and uncertainty is analytically helpful, it does, does not distinguish discrete and separate phenomena. Rather, risk and uncertainty are the extreme ends of a single spectrum. If it is correct method to treat a subjectively formed assessment of a probability distribution as if it were drawn from a distribution based on repeated experience, what is the difference between risk and uncertainty? Perceptions of the probability distribution formed under conditions of uncertainty are more likely to change materially with a small number or amount of new observations or experience or further analysis. The climate models on which the assessments of climate change impact are based are diverse. The climate models provide numerous observations on possibilities out of their diversity, as well as from each generating numerous results from repeated experiments. These are the senses in which the IPCC science draws from probability distributions. There are many points at which judgment rather than experience informs the model relationships. The resulting conclusions are therefore located somewhere on the uncertainty side of the, of the middle of the risk uncertainty spectrum. Every climate scientist has his or her own views on some issues that differ from the mainstream in detail. But the broad findings of the IPCC have general support among scientists with relevant specialist expertise. The broad wisdom of the IPCC is strongly contested by a small number and a small minority of reputed climate scientists. It is not contested by the large majority of specialists and by the leaders of the relevant learned academies in the countries of great scientific accomplishment. It is sometimes observed by dissenters that Galileo turned out to be right as a minority of one against the intellectual establishment of his time. Does not this establish that the intelligent dissenter can be right? Well, yes, it does. But the establishment of 17th century Catholic Europe was not learned in scientific method. 
would not Galileo be with the majority of established science today? Probably. <laughs> Mainstream science is right on a balance of probabilities. The dissenters are sometimes called skeptics. This is a misnomer in general. Many hold to their views with profound belief that is independent of external information or analysis. <laughs> to conclude the, this discussion of uncertainty and belief, I recall the perspective offered by the former Australian Science Minister, Barry Jones. In his World Meteorological Day address in 1992, he applied the famous wager of the 17th century French scientist, Blaise Pascal, to the climate change problem. If there were no God and one believed, pondered Pascal, what is the loss? But if there were a God and he rewards belief or denial in heaven and hell, the absence of belief is catastrophic. It is rational, said Pascal, to act as if there were a God. I should say here that Heinz would always be prepared to back the passions of his mind, even at these awful odds. <laughs> Pascal's wager would seem to make the case against the dissenters. But as we will see, it is not quite so easy with climate change. Belief acted upon could be costly and wasted if it is all a warp in the modern history of science. There is no alternative to seeking to measure the costs and benefits of efforts to mitigate climate change while being mindful of uncertainty. And regrettably, there is no alternative to acting on the results of that analysis now, actively or passively, as the passage of time is rapidly reducing the scope for choice amongst policies affecting climate outcomes. A modern acceleration in rates of human-induced greenhouse gas emissions is the source of contemporary concerns about anthropogenic global warming. Economic development over the past two centuries has taken most of humanity from lives that were brutal, ignorant and short, to personal health and security, material comfort and knowledge that were unknown to the elites of the wealthiest and most powerful societies in earlier times. In most of its first two centuries, the cornucopia of modern economic growth was located in a small number of countries in Western Europe and its overseas offshoots in North America and Oceania and in Japan. In the third quarter of the 20th century, it, it extended into a number of relatively small economies in East Asia. A new era began in the fourth, century, fourth quarter of the last century with the rapid expansion of the beneficent processes of modern economic development into the heartland of the populous countries of Asia, including China, India and Indonesia. From this has emerged what I've described as the platinum age of global economic growth in the early 21st century. Incomes are growing rapidly in a large proportion of the developing world. In the absence of major dislocation of established trends, this is likely to continue for a considerable period. Analysis presented in the draft report points to the platinum age contributing a greater absolute increase in annual human output and consumption in the first two decades of the 21st century than was generated in the whole previous history of our species, and then adding almost that much again in the following decade to 2030. The era of modern economic growth has been intimately linked to rapid expansion in use of fossil fuels. This is returning to the atmosphere a small part of the carbon that was sequestered naturally over millions of years through a process which created the conditions that were necessary for the emergence of human life on Earth. Uh, there is debate about whether the economic limits uh, to the use of fossil fuels will constrain global economic growth in the period immediately ahead or in the foreseeable future. The limit will be reached much earlier for liquid petroleum than for natural gas, and for gas much earlier than for coal. The success of technological improvement and market processes in expanding supply and easing demand for, nat for scarce natural resources in the first centuries of modern economic growth established confidence that global economic growth was unlikely to be constrained by the availability of fossil fuels in any time frame that was relevant to current decisions. It is clear from the present state of knowledge as it was not too early a generations, that it would be possible for the world economy to adjust to the approach of economically relevant limits to fossil fuel availability without bringing the increase in human consumption of goods and services to an end. One day, humanity will have to make that trans transition. 
But it would be easier and cheaper and less disruptive to the continued growth in incomes if it were done gradually, with strong focus on efficient policies to promote the emergence of commercially viable technological alternatives to the use of fossil fuels. The constraints on the economic availability of fossil fuels will aid the climate change mitigation process. But the review's analysis suggests that this will be nowhere near the extent necessary to avoid high risks of dangerous climate change. A revolution in humanity's use of fossil fuel-based energy will be necessary sooner or later to sustain and to extend modern standards of living. It will be required sooner if we are to hold the risks of climate change to acceptable levels. The cost that we bear in making an early adjustment will bring forward and reduce for future times the cost of the inevitable eventual adjustment away from fossil fuels. How much sooner and at what extra cost is the central question before the review. The cost of mitigation can be calculated for various levels and rates of reductions in emissions. Each level and rate of Australian mitigation can be related to a global mitigation outcome and the costs and benefits of mitigation compared. The policy task in setting Australian mitigation objectives, therefore, begins with identification of the costs and benefits, the benefits coming in the form of reduced risks of loss from climate change, for various mitigation ambitions. The cost of mitigation will be lower the higher are the market prices of petroleum, coal and natural gas. This is because the cost of business as usual to be compared with the cost of using the alternative low emissions technologies will be higher. This is a matter of high current interest at this time of historically high fossil fuel prices. The cost of mitigation will be higher the more ambitious the extent and speed of reductions in emissions. It will be lower the more efficient the instruments chosen to give effect to policy. An economically efficient approach to mitigation would generate a rising carbon price over time and therefore impose increasingly strong pressure for adjustment out of high emissions technologies and increasingly strong incentives for sequestration. For a given abatement task, emissions costs will be lowest if the emissions price rises at the interest rate. The annual costs of mitigation are likely to rise for some time as a rising emissions price forces deeper abatement. At some time, this tendency will be moderated and eventually reversed by improvements in the technologi technologies that emerge to replace fossil fuels and other sources of emissions. The cost of mitigation in Australia, and not only the benefits in avoided climate change, will be affected by the nature of the global mitigation effort. An effective global effort would make available a wider range of opportunities for trade in mitigation responsibilities, assigning higher effort to countries in which it can be achieved at lowest cost. A global effort would increase and distribute more equitably the world's investment in new technologies to develop lower emissions paths to consumption and production. And it would obviate the need for special policy measures to avoid carbon leakage. It is important to see any period in which an Australian mitigation effort is in place prior to an effective global effort as short, transitional and directed at achievement of a sound global agreement. Uh, it may be useful to share some developments in my thinking about public discussion and real development surrounding the cost of mitigation since the interim report in February and the discussion paper in March. The big external development has been the continued lift in oil, gas and coal prices to levels that are several times, more than several times, uh, uh, above forward market expectations only a few years ago. Community concern so far has focused mainly on petrol and diesel prices where the pass through to consumers is rapid. Rising gas prices to go much further with the internationalisation of the Eastern Australian gas market that is now in process and coal prices have begun to affect household utility bills. They will have much larger effects over the next few years and would do so even if there were no emissions trading scheme in contemplation. As I've just noted, higher fossil fuel prices lower the cost of mitigation. They reduce demand for fossil fuels. If an ETS were already in operation, the higher energy prices would reduce demand for permits and lower permit prices. The ETS would to some extent cushion the shock of exogenous increases in energy prices. In this period before the introduction of the Australian ETS in 2010, higher fossil fuel prices will cause Australian emissions to shift downward. If we had been more or less in line with the Kyoto requirements, we will now be tending below them. The draft report will examine in detail the implications of and opportunities created by the likely overperformance of Australia during the Kyoto period for the optimal 
for the optimal design of the ETS up to the end of 2012. Uh, and uh, um, I've considered carefully the proposal of Warwick McKibben, my longtime friend and ANU colleague, uh, to base a long-term permanent mitigation system on a hybrid of, of an emissions trading scheme, a ETS, and a price cap. Warwick was a pioneer of serious work on the economics of climate change in Australia. If his proposals for gradual and constrained action had been applied in the late 1990s when first suggested, we would be in a better position today. The world is now some way down the track on a different approach, an international system based on emissions reduction targets starting with developed countries. As discussed in the interim report, there are many imperfections in the Kyoto Agreement that must be corrected in its successes if there is to be worthwhile progress towards reducing risks of dangerous climate change. But the focus needs to be on the improvement of the system that has been emerging within the UN process. There is no time to start again. A price cap is not consistent with the emerging international approach. The idea that a cap could be put on the carbon price and Australia and the world accept the amount of mitigation that happens to come from that is inconsistent with the urgency of the emissions reduction task. The work of the review on the reality of the rate of growth in emissions in the platinum age has led to realisation that the time available for effective action is considerably shorter than previously assessed. Warwick's own work, adopting different methods, has arrived at a position on business as usual emissions that is, is as similar to ours as we both are different from the early conventional wisdom. Uh, there is indeed need and room for flexibility in the emissions trading scheme system to take account of any current misjudgments in the future costs of mitigation, fluctuations over time in economic variables affecting the permit price, and the shocks that from time to time enter any market. These were discussed in the interim report, and that discussion will be taken further in the